Hey everybody, Julian here. Um, I want to welcome all of my friends out in Hairbrained. What we're going to be doing today is going over uh, the one length bob, the uh, classic approach that I was taught when I worked back at Vidal Sassoon in New York. Now, the one length bob, one of the most important things is, is working with the natural growth patterns. So initially, finding the natural parting is extremely important. I find the easiest way to do that is to comb all the hair back and really just allow it to do what it naturally wants to do. I'll take the hair, I'll just lightly push it forward and I'll get the natural split that works with the growth pattern. Now, what that'll also do is that'll bring you back to the natural swirl wherever it may be on your client. Now, obviously on a doll head it's not going to have that but you know, you'll find when you're working on a person that'll happen very easily. You know, so it should be really effortless and it should be something you know, that you allow to happen rather than trying to force a parting in. Now, starting out through the back, what I want to do is I want to get a central division down the back from the <laughs> Frank, crown. Frank Mussolino says garage cuts. <laughs> yeah, baby. <laughs> Hair-brained west side in the garage. And Wayne joined, you're getting a lot of highs. Nice. Such, uh, now, once I get that uh, center division, I'm going to start to take my uh, partings parallel to the line that I'm going to cut. So, you know, the technical definition of a one length is cutting a line all on the same plane while allowing the hair to fall into its natural growth position. So everything really needs to work together. So the section, the angle of the comb, the angle of the scissor, and ultimately the line I cut. So now I want to get this hair really clean out of the way so I can see the balance really clearly. Now, also the height of the doll head or the client ultimately is really important. You want to be able to get yourself just about eye level to the line that you're cutting. So depending on how far you can get down, you need to lift the client up so that you can see. If I'm cutting here, I can't see what I'm doing and the balance can be really easily compromised. So I want to lower my vision, comb the hair straight down, and just really brace it with the comb. And then from there, cut parallel. So again, everything really working together, the section, the angle of the comb, and then the line that I cut. Now, once I establish that, the key to cutting a one length is consistency, right? And um, as easy as that sounds, it's difficult to do, right? So easy in concept, I find this haircut, but not easy to achieve, right? So taking the sections, allowing it to fall into its natural growth, just really lightly bracing it. And you see, I push out away from the skin and then cutting the same angle as my section, right? So everything, again, working together. I choose to work up one side, you know, and I find in the beginning, you know, you know someone may like to go back and forth if they're really, you know, working on their balance and things like that. But I find once you have the balance, there's a lot of advantages to doing one whole side than the other. So Jeremy Hickson yep. uh, has our first question. Excellent. Uh, do you angle the comb down or is it straight? Well, I start by sectioning it, putting it parallel to the section, and then combing it evenly, parallel, and then work in my scissor. And you can see how close the scissor and the comb work together. So the spine of the comb is flat, the scissor's flat, and they're at the same angle that I want to cut the line at. I hope that answers your question, Jeremy. And a question from Gina. Yep. Uh, what's the best way to choose the right length on a client, in your opinion? Well, I mean, it comes down to bone structure, comes down to uh, face shape, texture of hair, and then also what the client is comfortable with. Um, you know, so there's a lot of you know personal preference when it comes to that. So we're always we always want to work suitably, you know, visually with. Uh, the line that we choose to cut, but then also, you know, you want to, you want to cut a length that's going to be easy for them to manage themselves. So the texture definitely plays a part into it. Um, I find some of the most awkward lengths 
is when you get down into the shoulder length. Because what happens is when the hair hits the shoulder, it wants to kick out. Really to get the uh, best line, it needs to go above this uh, muscle right here so that it's undisturbed so that it can swing really freely. Um, we have a question from Marina. Would you um, mm -hmm. please show how you hold your scissors while cutting a horizontal line? Yeah, definitely. Hello from Italy. I love you guys. <laughs> Hello back to Italy. I'm going to be there quite soon. I'm looking forward to it. Now, all right, so the scissor, right? When I comb the hair down, I want to take the scissor and hold it as flat as possible. If I angle it, What's going to happen is I'm actually creating a slight amount of graduation. If I turn it back towards me, it's actually going to cut it a little bit longer through the upper lengths. So I want to hold the scissor flat to the line that I'm cutting. Now you can also see working with a straight wrist, right? So I don't want to try to turn my hand in different ways. I just want to keep the wrist really straight, allow the scissor to rest in the hand very comfortably. And then I just take my thumb very lightly and open and close, right? So that's the motion right there. And that's going to give you your truest line and the most control. Because I can really easily adjust the angle just by dropping my elbow or lifting my elbow, right? So the scissor is going to be controlled by the height of the elbow. So all of that has to be in good form. So I noticed that also your thumb isn't all the way through the hole. Yeah, I mean... That's something that is extremely important, and I see it done um, quite often where people put their thumb really deep into that hole. And what happens is it really um, it restricts the motion. So if I do this, now it's really hard for me to use the scissor gracefully, and I'm more chomping the hair. And you can see the effect it had on my arm. Now to get the, to get the scissor flat, I have to hike my elbow up above my shoulder, which is uncomfortable and again restricts motion. So if I can just really lightly drop the elbow and let the, let the thumb just kind of ride on the outside of the hole and then it'll open and close it really easily. Matthew um, has a question. Uh, well, first David Lowry wants some good pasta recipes, but then Matthew... <laughs> uh, has a question, uh, in length, dependent of the haircut, do you use the external line to draw a viewer's eye to certain features of the face? Does that make sense? Well, yeah, I mean, that comes down to suitability. So what, you know, whenever you cut a line into the hair, what it does is it draws attention to whatever that line points at. That's why the one length is really, um, it's very, very, very particular about where you cut it. So, you know, if you want to cut it following the jawline, you know, that can look really good, providing that the client has a beautiful jaw, right? So you also may want to go up slightly if you want it to go to the cheekbone. Again, only if that part of the face is flattering. If not, you have to stay away from it. This is probably one of the most um, aggressive shapes that you can cut into a client's hair when it comes to the suitability of it, because it is so definite, where layers tend to soften the features, the one length pronounces the features. So whatever feature you're pronouncing, it better be a good one. I hope that helped, Matthew. Yeah. So thank you very much. Uh, Sarah Marie would like to know what kind of scissor you're using and what are you recommend? Yeah, these, um, these are uh, made by a friend of mine from Infinity Shears here in California. And, uh, his name's Brent. And... Uh, he makes these. These are the B2. Now, more importantly than the brand of scissors, it's the length of the scissor, right? So I like to cut with five inch scissors quite often, but when I'm cutting a one length, I like a scissor with a little bit longer of a reach so that I can cut through the line in less strokes. So imagine if you're cutting a piece of fabric and if I was to just open and close the scissor very quickly, and a, a, a lot of times, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get a frayed edge, where if I can cut through in less strokes, I get a cleaner edge, right? So Vidal always said, um, you know, we cut hair as if it was fabric. So by doing that, I want to get the cleanest line possible.
Also, by working with a longer scissor, it keeps my hand out of the way. So it doesn't, distru- it doesn't um, disrupt the line that I'm cutting it while I'm cutting it. Tristan says, looks good, boys. Uh, thanks, Tristan, man. You've been doing some nice work. Been watching you, know, you and Ricardo on Instagram quite often, getting uh, a lot of great inspiration. So basically, I'm just saying I'm going to steal all your ideas. <laughs> Right, so now here in the front, what I'm doing is I'm just combing that hair slightly back. And what I want to do is comb it back and let it just fall into the line really naturally. If you want to use an area to comb it to, just comb it to about the front hairline. Now what that's going to do is it's going to leave me a little bit of longer length after the blow dry that I have to check away. But that's better than having the line roll up because then it's too short. So just by combing it back a little bit, it's kind of like a little bit of a safety net that I'll check off later. Another thing that I want to go through that you may have to do on your client is just when you're working over the ear. Now on the doll head, you don't have to worry about it so much or if the client has um, earlobes that lay quite flat, but if the earlobes stick out and protrude, you really need to be careful not to create a hole here. So the tension is very important. What I do a lot of times is I'll comb that through And then when I comb the line down, I'll just push right above the ear just to loosen that up and then cut my line through. Again, what that'll do is it'll leave a little bit of a longer length and you'll notice a little bubble or bump right there, which is better because once you create a hole, well, then you have to bring everything up to the hole, which might not be possible depending on, you know, the length and what the client wants, right? So again, cut this whole side through. Now I was talking about advantages to doing that. First of all, I can see my accuracy, right? So if I said I wanted to cut it an inch below the jawline, now that I take the line through, I can make sure it's there. But also what it does is, I find that it relaxes the client, especially if you're doing a large change, because now she can see that I cut it to where we agreed on, and then she's happy. You know, because especially if you're doing a change and the first section of hair is this long in the nape, you feel the, the client's vertebrae just like kind of tense up, right? So I want her to relax as much as possible. Uh, Michael uh, Bonacci just joined. And hey, he Michael. Said, Can you cover the difference between a graduated bob and a bob with graduation? Whew. Yeah, and I, I will, only because I love you, man. But uh, I talked also a lot about that when I did my uh, graduated bob. So it comes down to, you know, where, where's the uh, primary technique? So if I have a bob, which I'm cutting now, and then choose to graduate above the bob line, that's a bob with graduation. If I graduate the underneath into a line, that's a graduated bob. So it's like, what comes first, the bob or the graduation? If the bob comes first, it's a bob with graduation. If the graduation comes first, it's a graduated bob. And Jeremy uh, Hickson says, you make this look so graceful. Uh, Thanks, man. A lot of practice. And what, what I find is, you know, you, you have to learn to relax into it, right? Um, a lot of times we get tense when we're cutting hair um, and we overcomplicate things. As long as I stay true to the fundamentals, my foundation, right? So we think, okay, section the hair parallel to the line that you're going to cut. Comb the hair parallel to the section. Hold the scissor parallel to the comb and then cut the line that's parallel to the section. So everything works together. Section, comb, scissor, line. Right? And again, it should be relaxed. You know, also what I find, you have to realize that at this stage of the game, it's not perfect, right? And it, it won't be when it's wet. We want to get it to about 80% perfection, and then we dry the hair, and then we put that last 20% on it. Because what will happen is the hair is going to change no matter what I do from wet to dry. It's going to have a little bit of lift to it. So sometimes if I fuss with it too much, it actually makes it further away from the truth. Where if I just trust the technique and if I just trust what I'm doing, as I sit and fuss with that section, um, <laughs> you know, it's going to make it easier 
for me to uh, check it off at the very end. Robert just joined. Hey, Robert, how you doing? <laughs> I'm recutting my bob, Robert. <laughs> the client said it was uneven, so I had to uh, re do a redo for her. Actually, I was quite proud of my last one. Um, I was most proud of the blow dry. You know, the timing of it was very true to working in the salon. And also, it came out uh, really well, but um, somehow, probably my fault, it got lost in the clouds. <laughs> so, you know, and that's also something that I think is really important. You know, realistic pace. If you map out what you're doing, and you're working in the salon, and I always worked on a 45-minute appointment schedule. So with something like this, I had, if I mapped out my time wisely, I had 20 minutes to cut it, 20 minutes to blow dry it, and five minutes to perfect it, right? You do that eight times a day, and you're on to something. What's up? Uh, we have a question from uh, Davey. Sorry, so many comments coming in. Yeah. It keeps bumping. Um, when you angle your comb, yep. um, can you explain why it doesn't make the sides necessarily that much longer? Um, when I angle my comb. So your comb is angling down slightly, but then the bobble will end up sitting Well, you square. have to think. I'm, I'm going square. Um, and if I was cutting an internal square, I'd have a corner just at the curvature of the head. So with the line, I'm angling down into that corner, and then I'm coming through slightly flat, right? It's still down a little bit. So the length needs to meet right here, just behind the ear at the curvature of the head, just where it would be if I was doing a square layer, right? So it's the same idea. So it looks like it's going down. You also have to realize the head's down a little bit. So I'm going to start to lift the jawline because I'm coming through the sides, comb that hair out, and then follow that line through, right? You know, we also have to take into consideration that you're cutting a straight line on a curved surface, the neck, right? If I was to cut a straight line on a curved surface, well, now I just rounded my bob up, right? So I have a round bob. So for it to go down, this is what I'm doing. That's the angles that I'm cutting. You're getting so many uh, thanks for explaining all of this. Um, uh, Jeremy Hickson um, said, as far as the sectioning, diagonal or straight? Uh, parallel to the line that you're cutting, okay. which will always be a little bit angled, right? Um, so if I'm cutting uh, square, it's still angled down a little bit to that corner. If I'm cutting uh, A-line or triangular, it has a slight more you know, descend, and then if I'm cutting round, I start from the front and take my sections back. And then as far as where you're standing, Julian, are you um, standing, are you walking around the head? Yeah, always, always standing in front of what I'm cutting, okay. right? So what I'm doing is I'm pointing the center of my chest at where I'm cutting the hair. Once I start to move over and my hands start to get there, well, now I have to adjust and go back to standing in front of it. What I never want to do is cut off the center of my chest. So I don't want to cut here. So your hands are one place and your eyes are another then? My hands are one place. Like if, you're, if your hands are over here and you're standing over there, you don't have the, the perspective. Well, you don't, have, you don't have the perspective, but then also I don't have the balance to what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah. Right? So as soon as I feel my hands start to move past the center of my chest, I have to adjust where I'm standing so that I'm always in front of it. So this, cool. is, this is my cutting stance right here. That's where I would cut the hair, okay? So once the line starts to go over to the side, one way or the other, I have to adjust to get back in front of it so that, yeah, I can see it, but then also so I can control the line properly. Cool. You're getting a lot of thank yous still. Sarah Shaw says, I love watching your live videos, Julian. Ah, uh, thank you, Sarah. Well, it comes down to the fundamentals. And, you know, the fundamentals really are the things that give you the freedom to be creative. Uh, it took me a long time to grasp that. And, you know, to realize that the most creative cuts are basically a combination 
of the fundamentals. So, you know, the more you uh, understand and the better you can control those fundamentals, the more creative, right, you can be. Um, creativity is driven by the imagination. Your fundamentals are what gives you the ability to do them, right? So that's why these, uh, you know, these, these standards, these foundations, the fundamentals, the classics, whatever you want to call them, right? That's why they're so important. Emily answers, you're amazing. Can you come do my hair? <laughs> well, it depends, Emily, where you live. <laughs> All right, so again, just working that hair down, following that line through. The very front, combing slightly back. You know, and like you say, you can't comb it back too far. Right? It's only going to make the hair longer than what you need. So if any question, comb it back more than what you think. Because I'll dry the hair, I'll see where it wants to fall, and then you can see how that line just all of a sudden dips down. I'll blend that off. She's not going to wear her hair in her face. She's going to wear it back off the face. So depending on how much this lifts, when the hair is dry, you know, is going to really depend on how much extra length I need. You know, so if you have a client um, that has a lot of jump in through the front hairline, I would be a little bit more cautious. Right, so <coughs> working with my nylon brush, what I want to do is I just want to really lightly start to wrap the hair. Working, I'm going to be working in a circular motion to get the hair really flowing freely as much as possible. My friend Daniel Holzberger just joined. You know, Dan? Hey Daniel, how are you today? And Anton is saying, thank you, Julian. All right, so now just see working that hair off the face, especially if you're working in the client. The client care is extremely important. If the hair is dripping wet, I would never want to comb it down onto the client's face for obvious reasons. And then from here, once the hair is a little bit dry, just leafing that through. And I heard you say that you feel like it's important to be ambidextrous with your brush. Yeah, to get the same motion from one side to the other, you have to be able to blow dry with both hands, right? So on this side, I'm standing behind and the motion is curving in a certain direction. If I stand in front on the other side, now it's curving in the same direction, so I get an opposite motion. To get the same motion on the other side, I have to be able to switch hands, right? So right side, I blow dry with my right hand. Left side, I blow dry with my left hand. Start that right from the beginning, guys, because it isn't like all of a sudden, you know, you change the rules. You, you, you do it the way that you learn. So we want to be able to do that right from the beginning. Now, having said that, blow drying with my left hand took me a while to get comfortable with. But, you know, a lot of times people go, well, that doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel uncomfortable. Well, it's, it's not in the beginning. Uh, Jeremy Nixon, if you don't mind turning yeah. the blow dryer off for a second. Yep. Yeah. Um, you did a center part on this, but maybe um, you could tell us how you would address the side part. Natural parting, man. So if it was going to be worn to the side and she had a natural um, parting on the side, I would go from the natural parting to the swirl because that's where the hair is going to disperse in the back, then straight down. And so then all of the heavy side would end up on one side and the light side. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and with most haircuts, well, actually with all haircuts, where you part it is where it needs to be, uh, is where it's going to have a symmetric balance. If I was to change the parting, well, it's going to change the balance of the haircut. Right, so even if I'm doing layers and I start from here and I cut the layers proportionate to the parting and then the client wants to wear it over here, well then you're gonna have more layers on one side, heavier shape on the other side. Change the part, you change the line or the balance. Um, there's no way to com combat that. You know, what a lot of people started doing, well I'll just chop into it so that there's no shape whatsoever. Mm -hmm. That's not how I cut hair. Okay, well thanks. 
And Claire Connell says it's the first time she's watching and she's so glad she found it. Ah, uh, thanks, Carol. Well, we're going to be doing the series of this with Hairbrain. Um, we started, you know, maybe like a month and a half or so ago. And we're going through, you know, classic haircutting, the way I was taught. And we went through two forms of graduation. One was the graduated bob. The second one was what we call a firefly, which is a rounded graduation. And then today we're, uh, we're doing the bob, the one length. Now we're going to continue on. We'll move into layering and then carry on from there into more creative work. Now, you know, one of the things that I think is great by having Randy out here from Hairbrains now living in California, um, you know, me being friends with Gerard and Randy, we wanted to feature the West Coast hairdresser. You know, because when both Gerard and Randy were on the East Coast, you don't always have the opportunity, you know, to come fly all the way out here to do something like this. But we uh, designated <laughs> my garage. <laughs> it was funny, I, uh, I text DJ this morning and I said, you have the factory, I have the garage. <laughs> He, had a, he got a good laugh about that, but me and DJ have been friends for years as well. Um, you know, so we're going to be bringing out West Coast hairdressers. We're going to be featuring a lot of people that I know in the industry. Um, just to, sh you know, to spread the light, man, to share, to share their knowledge and their philosophies on haircutting. So and we got a, we got a, um, a few uh, People asking how they can find you. Can you tell us your Instagram? Just shut the door off for yeah, a second. Yeah, yeah. Um, you can find me um, on the corner of. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, check out Instagram. Um, it's under at Julian J U L I A N P E R L. And Robert posted uh, the handle for you. Nice. Now, now Robert's uh, your thanks, secretary. Robert. <laughs> You can find me uh, on Instagram. You can find me hanging out with Robert. I just uh, was with um, Robert Cromings. That's who I'm speaking about, everybody. With him in Florida for Paul Mitchell, the school's caper, which is, you know, the largest student hair show, I, I believe, in the world. And we had an amazing time there working with all the future professionals and, you know, doing some really beautiful hair for those guys. So again, even with the blow dry, everything really neat, organized, you know, taking control of the hair, not letting the hair take control of me. I used to get really frustrated when I blow dry the hair, and it was almost like I was trying to uh, destroy the hair and sometimes look that way. But again, just relax, work through really effortlessly, let the brush and let the, uh, the air do the work. I don't have to stress out. I don't have to use a lot of energy and pull the hair too much. You know, I mean, I have an old blow dryer right here. There's a lot of lighter ones that people can use. This one can be quite heavy, but at the same time, my elbow and my shoulder are very relaxed, and I just let the blow dryer sit in my hand. I let the handle rest on my wrist, and it just kind of sits there. You know, sometimes I think we make things more difficult and, you know, put too much effort into it when it really, it's not needed. And, you know, it's another thing about the classic haircuts. You know, we're working in ways that are the most efficient approach to what we're trying to achieve. We're making things simple, which they should be. You know, I think we complicate things much too much. So Matthew is asking, uh, I noticed you cut on the diagonal forward, uh, but the sections are in the diagonal back. Yeah. Um, I like to explain that. Yeah, a couple that things. make it easier for you know, well, natural fall. Or... Couple, couple reasons. Um, one is I want to get the wet hair away from the face as quickly as possible. Um, client hair. My client's been sitting here with wet hair, not feeling very pretty for a long time. So she can start to see the results a little bit quicker. 
but also I find that it meshes together um, a little bit nicer and it just gives me a little bit more of a natural flow and movement to the hair. Um, you know, generally with my blow drying, I'll work on the diagonal from front to back. Um, I'll work the same way if I'm smoothing with an iron. Paul is asking uh, where she can get one of those dryers and how much it will cost. Oh, uh, you got to go to eBay. I don't think they make these anymore. So that's why I'm using it also because I don't want to create a, bl a blow drying war. <laughs> right? So um, these were made by a company called Wigo. And I believe that they went out of business quite a while ago. But um, that's pretty funny. Yeah, great blow, <laughs> great blow dryer. They should have named it We Stay. Yeah. Yeah. Another thing with the blow dry, I have to exercise patience. I can't get frustrated. I can't try to start going quicker. You know, it's like the hair is only going to dry so fast. As long as I keep the air on the hair and the brush moving through it, it's going to dry as quick or as slow as it wants to. Then I think once you start getting frustrated and you start trying to rush through the blow dry is when you start to lose control of the hair and you know you can end up with it being frizzy. You can see I'm trying to put a little bit of lift on the hair. So the more I lift away from the roots, the more roundness and the more volume I'm going to create. You know, I mean, I like it down nice and flat, but I think clients enjoy a little bit of movement to their hair. And as much as that can look really dramatic, you know, it's not always practical. Uh, any reason that you don't use a concentrator? Yeah, I lost mine. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, it's just, it gives me uh, more of a free flow with the air. You know, so certain things, I think if you're working with a round brush or certain textures of hair, you may want the air concentrated into one area, which really is a more powerful blow dry. But I think with something that I want looser and something that I want to move a little bit more, the, uh, you know, the open flow is a bit better. It's also, you know, I find better for wrapping the hair and leafing the hair. It's been a lot of thank yous for all these details. It's all about the details, guys. You know, I mean, I spent a lifetime uh, thinking about the whys of everything. And, you know, what I try to do is I try to share my uh, philosophy of why this and why that. Um, I also, you know, I've been an educator for over 20 years, and I've had a lot of people ask me a lot of questions about a lot of things. And I always um, think about the answer as much as possible. And when you explain something to a number of people, people understand things differently. So you have to learn to speak a way and you have to learn to explain it in a way that people understand what you're doing. There's no mystery, there's no complication, you know, there's no um, magic in a sense. Everything has a reason, a purpose, um, and it has to have a logical explanation. Um, if I didn't know something, and if I don't know something, I make it a point to find out whether <coughs> whether it's thinking about it um, or whether it's talking to some of the people that I work with, right? And I'm really lucky. I have a, a very uh, good community of friends that are hairdressers that I respect, that I work with on a regular basis. I'll steal a phrase from uh, Mr. Cromies. You're only as good as the people that you hang out with. So I hang out with good people and you know we share we share knowledge. We share ideas. <coughs> so
So right now I'm just going through the blow dry. It seems like wrapping is a better approach. I was trying to leaf through, but I'm not getting the control that I want, especially through the top. So, you know, once I find that the hair bunches up, I have to adapt to it. There's no, you know, magical number. Well, wrap it three times, leaf it four times. You have to really look at the hair. You have to see what's happening and you have to react to it. So I'm getting a little bit of resistance. You can see the brush coming through the top and it's just getting a little bit uh, stagnant. <coughs> so wrapping through it is giving me the control. And that comes down to the texture of hair. If the hair was a little bit silkier, you know, I may wrap it less and leaf it more. Jonathan Mason is saying he's lucky to have had you as an instructor. No, nah, thanks, Jonathan. If somebody wants to book you as an educator, where can they do that? Well, I would say the easiest thing is to contact me on Instagram. Okay. And then from there, what you know we can do is we can talk about what your salon's needs are um, and then set up a uh, program for you know what you want and customize it based on the needs that you guys have. Um, I think every salon is different, every team is different, um, and the most important you know thing is is having that individual conversation prior to any class, right? So if you contact me, if something you know that you you know want to pursue or or, uh, or do, we can definitely make arrangements. Um, you know, I travel all over doing classes, doing education, um, so it's definitely something that is available. And how do you do with lefties? Um, I, it's, it's the most simple thing possible. I mean, it's, it's only an issue I find when people make it into an issue. Um, when you're cutting hair, I don't concentrate on, I don't concentrate on, well, I'm cutting the left, but you're cutting the right. It's all about the hand position, right? So if I say we're going to start with vertical sections and we're going to cut the side that our fingertips are pointed up with a palm-to-palm -palm technique, I would work on this side. You would just simply be doing the same exact thing on the other side, right? So I think once you start getting into the whole, well, left-handed people cut this and right-handed people cut that, it makes it a problem. Cool. And you, um, Matthew, you have a friend in Croatia. He said if you'd like to come to Croatia, and he would be happy to host the class. Oh, I'd love to, Matthew. Definitely, you know, that's something we could work out. I've never been to Croatia, but I've heard some really amazing, you know, things about the people there. And from what I have seen, the hairdressers in Croatia are very good. Very technical minded hairdressers, which is, you know, what I really enjoy. So it's just about dry. Yeah, that's beautiful. Getting there. One of my art directors back in New York used to say, when I would ask him, how do you check a bob? And he would say, have your client run around Fifth Avenue and then come back in, and if it falls into a clean line, you did a good job. <laughs> nice. You know, so hair's meant to move. I think for a photograph, you know, it's a stagnant. But also by wrapping it, I'm looking at the movement of the hair. I'm looking at you know how it falls. I'm paying attention, you know, to every aspect of the hair, of the line. You know, I still have to clean all this underneath, which is normal. You know, so for those of you guys that aren't uh, used to cutting bobs, or you know, you're newer to the industry, a lot of people are like, "Oh my God, that's so bad! I made a mistake." No, it's just part of the process.
right, so <coughs> back to the scissor. Now, first thing I want to do is just comb the hair through. And I'm working now with the wider teeth of my lovely orange wise part comb. And comb that hair down. And what I want to do is I want to tilt the head forward. And what that does is it exposes the line. Now, it's, it's really difficult, guys, to cut on plastic. I mean, I could sit here and fuss with this thing for a day and a half. But it, it's not the same as a person. I mean, yeah, that, that's not giving me the privilege to not do a good job or make excuses. But it is what it is. Right? So I want to get it as clean as possible. What I do rely a little bit more on, and I'll show you in just a moment, with the doll head, is I'll rely a little bit more on pointing into it, because it's hard to get the, the uh, blunt edge of the scissor onto the doll head, where you know the skin has a little bit of give to it, so I can push in on the skin and expose the line, where the doll head just doesn't have as much give to it. there man it's getting there now you also noticed i mean there's a lot of talk about you know cutting this you know and i see a lot of people they'll cut the one side down and then they'll cut the other side back right that's you know i mean yes it's it's not incorrect but i reserve that for dry hair um, when it's wet i cut always with my palm facing down so on the one side i cut down and on the other side i'm cutting up into it now i just posted something on instagram and I was talking about backhanding, you know, and I took the hair and I worked this way, right? So now at this part of the game, that's fine, right? So I'll work and I'll cut back into it. So I'm working backhand, but it's more of a refinement technique to me, you know, opposed to, you know, cutting it that way when the hair is wet. So again, just combing the hair through. You can see me just putting my finger there to hold that hair in place. Yes. Uh, Matthew said he, he notices when cutting horizontally on dry hair, or that when you're cutting horizontally on dry hair, mm -hmm. you pull the hair back as you close the scissors. Can you explain why you do that? I pull the hair or back. Or pull your scissors back while you close, probably, is what you said. Oh, so I cut forward and then back off so I can cut forward again, back off, cut forward, back off. You know, and it's also, you know, it comes down to pushing the hair. Like if I want to push it forward, I push as I cut. If I want it to stay a little bit truer, I come out when I cut. So if you want to, if you don't want the hair to move, if I don't want the hair, exactly, yeah, if I don't want the hair to move, I get it in and then cut on the way out. If I want to push the hair, like if I'm, if I'm making it move forward, I'll go forward as I cut. So the timing is really key. So you do it both ways. You don't always, uh, there's no yeah, to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's like, there's no one size fits all. You know, but I mean, Matthew, that was a, I mean, a good eye that you caught that. Um, I mean, we're talking about subtleties that, you know, I think a lot of times until you can get the line straight, it doesn't really matter, does it? You know, so it's depending on where you are in the game, you know, because like little things like how I'll take my scissor and angle it now cut. And I'm actually graduating the hair a little bit, or I'll angle it the other way if I want to get the uh, the hairline sections right. So if all the hair is down, and I take it and I turn it, I can cut different parts of the hair. So if I cut the underneath, I angle it away. If I want to cut the top layers, I angle it up. You know, so little things like that. How wow. you use the scissors are so I'm loving all these. Little yeah, things. extremely important. Um, you, you, you have to uh, get really comfortable. These have to be, you know, extensions of your fingers. 
Daniel Pasura just joined. Good How's it going, Daniel? Damn, this side's pretty good, man. <laughs> Woo! It's funny because I've been cutting hair for quite a while. And it's like, when I cut a bob and it's like almost done, it's, like, it, it's that feeling of, whew, man. <laughs> it's not bad. It's okay. It's all right. See, now here, how, see, I'm just tilting away. So I'm taking my scissor from flat to the blade coming out. So I'm hitting the hairline sections and I'm not disrupting the top sections of hair. You know, um, lots of little things that you do almost instinctually, but based off of repetition and doing it over and over again. Whew. All right, so back to the back now. Let's see what we got. Not too bad. So he's getting that hairline. Again, so I'm tilting the scissor away. Daniel said it's nice to be watching this live in honor. Oof. Man. I'm getting a workout, Daniel. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's, it's funny. It's like, you know, one of, the, one of the questions was always like, well, how do you know when you're finished? And it's like, well, basically when you, your, your eyes start to get all blurry and watery and you can't see anymore. So I'm Jay getting Edges to that point. In your class last Sunday said it was an awesome experience. Oh, awesome, man. Yeah, I had a good time. I was in uh, Hackensack, New Jersey. Always good to go back to uh, my home region, which would be the Northeast, technically Philadelphia. But Jersey's close enough, so I guess. This is a good time again to, to let people know how they can uh, get in contact with oh, you yeah, if yeah. they'd like to have a class. Yeah, so guys, um, Instagram is my method of uh, you know, communication to you all. Um, it's Julian, J-U-L-I-A-N-P-E-R-L. And you can message me and then I'll send you, you know, my email, my phone number and all my contact to, uh, you know, talk about, um, you know, scheduling classes and things like that. Um, I'm I love that you're using this glass in this picture. I know. Here. Yeah, I know. So <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm like looking at this one over here, you know, any kind of reflection, right? But the mirror, it's actually a good point because the mirror is, you know, such an important part of cutting the bob, using the mirror to check the balance and things like that. So she's looking pretty good, you know, but it's also just a little bit of lift to it, I think is nice. Um, rather than trying to do it really flat and plastered, I would be fighting the hair more than, you know, working with the hair. But, you know, again, just finishing up, what I want to do is I'm going to uh, lift that top section and just lightly check that off we could say yes it's technically not a one length anymore but um that's okay i'm allowed to do this you are too it's whatever you know make it work man what it's going to do is going to let just let the hair sit in graduate it just very 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 slightly there's very few textures of hair that look good purely one length you know, and when Vidal made this hair cut popular in the 60s, you noticed, you know, the clients that he did it on, well, first, were all extremely gorgeous. And they had a very, you know, medium to fine straight hair. So there, there wasn't a fight to try to get the hair to sit. So, it, you know, it was very, uh, it, it's not... A pure one length isn't right for everybody. You have to have a symmetric face shape and you have to have hair that is very uh, well behaved. Now that doesn't mean that you can't do this shape, but you have to do little things like this to get it to work. So just adding that little bit of graduation because Dolly here has very thick hair. All right. Yes. Uh, so 
we have a young lady that's in beauty school. And uh -huh. I thought this would be a you know a nice thing. Um, she's just about graduated. Yep. Um, can you tell her what it was like for you? Like she's a little afraid to cut hair. Uh -huh. Were you were you scared at any point um, when you were in beauty school? Is there anything you can help her to understand um, how to get past her fears as she gets ready to graduate? Yeah, I mean, cut a lot of it, but. You, you always should have a certain apprehension and just, I find, once you think that you can win every battle with hair is when you lose one. You know, you always have to take it as serious as possible and you have to have that little bit of caution to what you're doing um, and that kind of keeps you humble. But, you know, I found through doing it over and over and over again and a lot of times cutting it too short, I learned how to get it right. Um, and it was, you know, kind of funny. I remember when I was, you know, doing my training program, my uh, art director had a great, you know, little comment that she would say after all my haircuts. She'd be like, it's going to look great in two weeks, <laughs> you know, because I always just took it a little bit too much. Um, but, you know, it, it's okay to be a little bit afraid, you know, um, but you, you just have to keep at it. You have to keep at it. So yeah, we all we all feel felt that way. We all feel that way. People ask me all the time, "Well, you get nervous when you go on stage?" Well, if I didn't, I shouldn't be doing it. So, all right, guys, I think I fussed enough with the one length. I think we have the gist of it. Um, you know, uh, it'll be up. We won't get it. We won't erase it this time. I think Randy and I are also going to film another one. Yeah. You know, so that we'll have um, a, a staged version of it, but going through the same exact techniques, um, the same, you know, format. And, you know, check out for the next time. We're going to be doing it probably next week.